Praise be to Jesus and Mary, and welcome to the Catholic Family Podcast. This is the What is a Woman podcast, hosted by Mandy and Holly. Let's begin our show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the What is a Woman podcast. My name is Holly, and as always, I'm joined here by my mother, Mandy, and we're happy to be back for another week here of What is a Woman We'll begin our episode by saying, Jesus, meek and humble of heart, make our hearts like unto thine. So um, by the time everybody's listening to this, it's... Uh, Ash Wednesday. Well, no, you, it's Thursday after Thursday. Ash Wednesday. But we're, we're recording this on, on Ash. Ash Wednesday. Yeah, so uh, we'll just uh, maybe begin by saying that we hope you all, everybody has a very um, blessed and fruitful, you say fruitful, Lent? Yeah. When I was uh, when we were doing our morning prayers this morning, I said at the end, I told the kids, well, in the prayers, I said, "Dear sweetest Jesus, please help us to have a blessed and fruitful Advent." <laughs> <laughs> and the kids, and then we made the sign of the cross, and the kids were like, "Mom, it's not Advent. You messed up!" And oh, they laughed. They thought it was hilarious. I'm like, the "Kids think things are so it's funny. not that funny." <laughs> but okay. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> so they're like, we just had Advent. <laughs> they, they got a good chuckle out of it. But I was like, no, everybody, it's Lent. <laughs> yeah, I got up and I picked my phone up. I don't know what I was looking for. I can't remember or what I was doing. But, you know, all of a sudden there's Michael Knowles. And and, I, and I'm just like, and I go, wait a minute. It's Lent. You're not doing this. <clears throat> you're yeah. not doing this. The world doesn't exist. It's you nope. and God. I know. That's, uh... you know, you're taking her back in time. So, and I mean, it is, that is, um, where was I reading it yesterday? You know, I can't remember where I was reading it, but anyways, that, um, you know, Lent is the, is the gift from Holy Mother, the church that gives us the opportunity to, um, that it, I'm not going to use the word forces us, well, force but in a, a way word. it kind of it does, is forced because people you know, wouldn't do it. Because we wouldn't do these things we otherwise. We're too weak, our fallen human nature. So it gives us Lent is a gift from Holy Mother Church to say you need to be yeah. ready and you need to prepare yourself for for uh, Jesus and the sacrifice that He did for us. So we know we wouldn't do them because um, we don't persist afterwards. No, right? Although I did, it did say too that. Um, Oh, I know. That's where it was. Somebody shared a picture in one of the chats I'm a part of, too, uh-huh. that um, that the penance and the things that you give up, Lent is the opportunity that you should give up the things that you're most predominantly at fault for or your habitual sins. Right. Because Lent is the, is the gift that Holy Mother Church gives us to help us overcome these predominant faults. To straighten our way. To straighten our way. So Lent is kind of that, like, because it forces you to really give it up, right? Because you're making yeah. um, a promise to God that you're not going to do those things. So if you are struggling with something, pick that thing. And give it up, and then right. hopefully after Lent you stick with it. Right. I, I mean, I meant more like I mean, obviously we're always supposed to be trying to straighten our way, better ourselves, yeah. and become closer <clears throat> to God. But you know, all the fasting. Right. Oh yeah, those things we don't. Yeah, oh, I don't. Do like, <laughs> okay, we're done with this. You know, like nobody continually does that. Yeah. So. Well, even in, even this morning, I got up and I'm like, okay, three meals a day, two smaller meals, one big meal. And I, I normally, I don't eat breakfast, right? But then Lent does something to you. It does. Where you're like, I'm starving. And then I had to tell myself, Holly, it's only Ash Wednesday. Calm down. You like, know, you're not starving. You're, you never eat breakfast. Your brother rarely eats more than one meal a day. And now because Lent's he here, He doesn't he's, snack. He doesn't do things like that. He'll have... And it may be two. He might have two, like a very <laughs> tiny one and then a dinner or something, you know. And this morning I got up and I was making a potato soup for our Ash Wednesday. And I had that bowl of olives, the garlic filled yeah, olives that, sitting yeah. there. And he goes, what's that? He, he went, went to, to pick you. one up. And, he, I, and then he stopped. Did he went, you? Wait a minute. Oh, I thought you were going to say you smacked it out. No, <laughs> he knew right away, right? He put it back. 
And I was and I was like, that is so out of character for, for you. you. Yeah, like, he's, so, he's not a picker. No, he's not. That's yeah. And here it is. It's let very right off the hop. Ash Wednesday, <laughs> and you think you're gonna have a garden you're stuff to of. No, you're not. No, you're not. <laughs> Unless you want that to be your breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> well, he could actually. He probably could have. He probably he could have called it his meal. Was, <laughs> I know, but it's funny that what Lent puts in your head that. On any yeah. other day, you would just pick up a stuffed olive and go, oh, well, that's fine enough, I guess. Yeah. But not during Lent. Right. You know, so anyways, um, anything else we uh, no. want to do there? Just jump right into our book? Well, actually, uh, read read our next chapter. Uh, is this it? <laughs> duty towards servants? Is yeah. That, yeah, works of mercy. <laughs> I had to. Yeah. Duty, chapter 21, duties towards servants. Yeah. <laughs> so how many servants do you have? <laughs> last, I wish. <laughs> last time I checked, I'm I'm the only servant in our house. <laughs> but so anyway, do they do they actually mean servants? They actually mean domestic servants. Okay. Now uh, I don't. I well, I'm sure there's going to be some way well, that we can allocate we, this to something. Well, I did. I life. thought. Well, you know, because you can um, say those under you are, uh, in your charge, but no, it doesn't work either. Oh, okay. Because. I mean, if I were a job and at a boss, I wouldn't have the same obligations to people underneath me. Right. Like, or like you know, that a d- you would have for a domestic servant. servant yeah. and, and so what I, I thought was really funny about this was, um, I was thinking in my head, so, so this is, um, you know, relevant mm-hmm. to the year. Yeah. Like, women had domestic servants. servants. Yeah. Right? They had... If um, they were rich enough. They had wet nurses looking after their children. Yeah. They had all these things, uh, and um, and who would have thought? Like, if you imagine being, you know, in the year eighteen ninety, you have your well, one or the other. I'm oh. pretty sure we would have been the servants. Uh, my uh, my aunt Annie Grace went into service in nineteen. She was from England, so not, it was about nineteen twenty, probably. Yeah. She was in service. That's what they called it. They called it going into service. service. Yeah. And, uh, but who would have thought back then that one day this wouldn't be a thing? Right. That you wouldn't have this. That you that a, a, a household wouldn't have servants. servants. Yeah. You know, and they needed them for lots of reasons because, I mean, the poor, they they didn't live in house, grand houses, right? But if you lived in a grand house, you just have to think about this for a minute. There was no central heating. Well, that you know what, that's funny because that's what I was telling my mom this morning because we moved recently yeah. and we heat our house with propane. Now, that's very expensive in the winter to run my furnace off of the propane. Yeah. Like we got, uh, we've been here, I'm going to say just three months now, almost just three months. We've gotten two propane bills in three months. One was $382 and the next one was $486 yeah. in three months. Yeah, no, I know. So the, my furnace relies on that propane. It was just sucking it. And I said to my husband, I said, there's a wood stove here. We have to shut that um, furnace off. Yeah. Like the furnace has to go completely off and we have to use the wood stove. Right. So we've been doing that. But I was telling my mom this morning, the problem that we're having is, you know, you put a log on and you go to bed and you wake up. And the log's gone out and the house right. is ice cold, right? right? Because nobody's feeding the fire. And you think about these massive, man- not mansions, mm-hmm. estates that they would have had yes. back in 1888. And they had a fireplace in every room. They had a fireplace in every room and someone was responsible for keeping those fires going. And even even the clothing, like, the, like I mean, if... If you're the ma- mother, the madame of the house or whatever you want to call it, like you can't even get dressed yourself. Self, yeah. You know, too much. those buttons going all back. Well, like, up your back. All yeah. up the back. They require, or the corsets, they require special, you know. Yeah. And even even the cooking, like the, the cooking, there was no, you know, chicken nuggets in a box. Right? <laughs> so they had, like, they these were arduous duties. Mm-hmm. Like, and so if you were going to have a household, it had to have servants. Right. It had to have a it domestic staff. function without them. Right. Obviously, the, um, the, the poor did not have, they didn't have, they were living in like two rooms. Yeah. My aunt, the one that went into service, she has, she told me they had, um, you know, they had two bedrooms. Yeah. In her house and all the boys, and there was a lot of children. Yeah. All the boys slept on one 
bed in one bedroom, and all the w- girls, including her mother, uh, her mother was a widow, so slept in the other bed. They slept sideways on the bed, <laughs> right? And I, so, so if you, you go imagine? through history and you see, um, like, um, they'll take you through. There's um, there's a lot of English series on on the houses and how they were operated they and, stuff. and stuff like and I always watch them so I find them so fascinating but you would go into the house of the poor there would be nothing in that bedroom but a bed yeah nothing and, and in one show that I watched they they lifted up the floorboards and that's where like a young girl would keep she would like they'd loosen a floorboard and that's where she'd keep her little treasures oh my word yeah, because like there was They nothing. didn't even have a dresser. Yeah, you know, Not, there was like hooks. A bureau, there was nothing. maybe a little bureau. Maybe yeah, there was that. Maybe there was. You know, but there, there you know, it's just a, a way of But then of again, life. you're also sharing that bureau with probably four other, four at least four other girls yes. or whoever, how many kids you had in yes, your family. Yes, right. They had so, big families. So if you were going to live in a domestic house, per se, you know, mm-hmm. what they would call, even if you were like on the middle even if you weren't like Downton Abbey, say when you were just middle, middle class. class-ish. But I don't know, it's was still, there a middle class? Yeah, there was a, a certain, like oh, there were okay. there were degrees of, of wealth. Right. Like, um, I mean, everybody's familiar with Jane Austen, maybe they're not, I don't know, Pride and Prejudice. Yeah. Right? Um, but she wrote a lot about that because those women were destitute without a man. Right, right, but they were technically. I think I do believe they would have been considered middle class. Well, they weren't poor. Like they I weren't did, poor, I actually, but they also weren't Mister Darcy status. No, they either. weren't Mister Darcy status. Right, he couldn't afford to give those girls a dowry, mm-hmm. which they absolutely had to have right. to get married. Right, and the 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 other one was the sense and sensibility one. Uh, that family, when the dad died, they were just they, tossed. Yeah, they were. They lost everything. Yeah. They were, they were definitely poor. And they still had servants. They still went to live in some cottage, cottage. Cottage. And they still had servants. It was it was the mother's cousin. Yeah. They went and lived right. in his cottage. So, I mean, it's just a different lifestyle. And the book is pertaining to that that style. So when I when I read through the chapter, I thought this none of this pertains. So I thought, I thought me, the one thing I did find interesting was the very first paragraph. So I thought we would read it. And um, and then I would just give you a rundown in case you ever have domestic servants. Oh, so we're not going to read the chapter. We're not going to read the chapter. Saying. We're going okay. to just read that one first paragraph, like there, and something. then we'll buzz. Oh, I'll give you a brief rundown okay. of what to do with your domestic servants. Okay. And then we'll move <laughs> Should on. Should you the have next. them? <laughs> Should you have them? <laughs> okay. All right. So chapter twenty-one: duties towards servants. Quote: Women who have tasted the gift of God and felt the sweetness of his yoke are exposed to two opposite dangers they either persuade themselves that is it is enough to think of their own salvation without attending to that of their neighbor or forgetting themselves through a mistaken zeal they yield altogether and without precaution to the charitable feelings and natural generosity of their heart these two disorders are equally opposed to the dictates of true piety the practice of religion consists in the fulfillment of all our duties and if it is allowable for unmarried persons to devote themselves exclusively to their own spiritual affairs, we cannot say the same of those whom Providence has appointed to watch over a family. They cannot sanctify themselves without laboring with zeal and perseverance for the sanctification of those under their charge. Right, End okay. Quote. So uh, what that what that says is there's two uh, disorders. There's two opposite disorders. One is... Um, you only think of your own personal right. sanctity and you don't right. think of others. Actually, can I just say something about that? Because somebody had said something to me on the weekend and this was very profound. And um, I don't, I'm not going to say where she, she told me she read it somewhere. And I, I, sorry, I can't remember where she said she read it. But she told me that we often get caught up in that, you know, we're here to san- uh, to save our souls. Right. We're here for the sanctification of our souls and to get to heaven. But that's actually not the first, that should not be the first, um, that's not the most important. Uh-huh. The sanctification of our soul is not the most important because that's very self-serving. Right. I'm here to save myself. The first and foremost thing is to give greater and honor and glory to God in all that we do. Right. That is the first thing and that is why we are here. And in doing that, 
Yeah, we, sanctify, we will save our souls. We will sanctify ourselves. But we, we get caught up in that, that attitude that I'm just here to save my soul. I'm just here to get to heaven. Yeah. That becomes very all about you and your will. Yes, it's another form of self-love. Self-love. Whereas if, you know, you're not, you're here to give greater honor and glory to God in all that you do. Right. Not just one thing, not just when you go to Mass, not in everything. And I've even said that, and I, I mean, I, I'm wrong about that, but I, uh, but mostly, well, I think, I don't know that I'm wrong. I'm just going to say, when I was talking to people, I was trying to get them to think about their own sanctity. Right. Because it's the two sides of the coin. You can't, you can't just think about yourself. Right. And I just got, I'm, I'm just here doing my prayers, doing my sacrifices, doing my penance and getting to heaven and whatever you people do, you do. Yeah. You know, and you can't be all about worrying 24 mm seven, -hmm. what everybody else is doing to save right. their souls, you right. know, especially those in your charge. Right. right. And um, that's what the book is saying. Like it's a disorder. Right. And I've met people that they just, uh, worry, worry, worry about you know what their children are doing. What and I'm like, look, you got to sanctify yourself. Mm -hmm. You got to stop worrying about these people. And and I did I did use this term too. I've I've said like it's like just think of it as a a different kind of narcissism. I yeah. did say that you know because yeah. it is. But but mostly I was saying that because they were too focused on everybody what everybody else was doing wrong, right. and they weren't paying any attention to themselves, right. You know, so the book is the book states, which is true. You have to find the balance. You are, you know, you can't just ignore everybody else. And in this case, um, and or just focus on yourself. Although it did say that if you're a single person, you can very easily focus on yourself. Like you kind of have that. And, well, you and, fall and, into that. And single people are <clears throat> are actually um, required or. or I think they are required to a higher level of Held sanctity. to a higher level of Because standing. they have more time. Right. And they don't have the responsibilities. Right. To, to um, you know, just focus on themselves. Right. Although, um, you know, there are missions and there are things. They should be serving the poor I, somewhere. Yeah. I mean, if you're single, you should be figuring out how in the world you can serve God. Because, you know, going to Mass on Sunday. Is not enough. Is not enough. Yeah. You know. And, um, yeah, so basically, so that, of course, so this is leading into the responsibility that a, the the woman of the household has to her domestic servants, right. that she is responsible for them. So the book goes Do on. Do they mean spiritually? Yes. Okay. Like they're in her household, <clears throat> they're part of her household, she's responsible for their education. Right. Well, and the example that you put the out example, to them. example, she's, she's responsible for making sure that they get like basically proper education. Right. They, you know, like even that they would have the opportunity, you know, that they need to go to mass or they need to do their prayers or like you are responsible. If they're right. In like your you, house, you can't allow their duties to come before mass. Right. Like you, I, like you can't, if there's a servant in your charge, you have to give them the opportunity to glorify right. and sanctify God so, first. So, I mean, if you were, you know, the manager or even say you owned, you know, Loblaws or something. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you don't have that same obligation. Uh, right. Well, maybe you well, do. Maybe you do. Maybe you do. I don't know. Like, yeah. Like, my, I will say my mom and I had a store, and I will admit, we were open for on Sundays, and then we were like, no, we're not doing this anymore. Yeah, because like, it was a touristy type thing. It was a it? touristy type thing, but it just got to point, and we didn't have staff. It was me and my mom. Like, yeah. So we weren't making anybody else work on a Sunday. But I was... It just got to a point where I was like, you know, we shouldn't be work like we shouldn't be open. We should like, just do the sacrifice. We should just do Even the sacrifice. Everybody, it was the type of store that you would expect to be. You would on. expect. I, well, and people were kind of annoyed when we closed on Sunday, yeah. but I just got to a point where I was like, well, get over it. You know, yeah. like I'm not gonna yeah, work so, on a Sunday. I mean, but most people who are <clears throat> unless unless you're the head head cheese, yeah, you don't really get to make those says. Like if you're like the manager of you know walmart walmart you, you don't, don't have a say over walmart's hours you and know? all you know all these uh court these chains you don't even have a say over what music is played no and there's you know some... so you don't have any say even if you own them 
Yeah. So um, there's that. But so unless you're the head head person, but if you're the head head person, you do have an obligation to your people to make sure that you know they're able to do what they, they need, need to do yeah. to save their soul. Right. Right. You know. So but I think that's very few people. Yeah. So is that it on that chapter? Yeah. So we'll just, just skip over. And if there's anybody listening and that has servants, well, wow. maybe you know, maybe in a few years we'll be back to this. Maybe, I don't know. Yeah, maybe we'll be back to that. <laughs> We'll, we'll be, have to come back to the book and see what it says. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, so we'll go forward into chapter 22, which is maternity and its duties, education of young children. So this is something that we probably need to know. It is something. This is something we very much need to know. Yes. Yeah. All right, so we'll just take off here. So, quote, understand well your dignity and your duties. O you who carry in your womb a being redeemed by the blood of the Savior on Mount Calvary. Rising above merely natural considerations, contemplate your situation and your obligations, not in the light of fancy or in the fictions of poetry, but in the mirror of faith, which can alone instruct you fully on this important subject, end quote. Right, so basically, um, this chapter is about the maternity, right? So, carrying the baby. Yeah, but that's pretty, um, you know, that's pretty, oh, you who carry in your womb a being redeemed by the blood of the Savior. Right. That's pretty uh, hefty. The baby like, that you're I think the author is telling us, like, you're carrying a being yeah. that our Lord came down yeah. to save yes. just as much as any, you know. And, I mean, the biggest, the most important thing that's really hard for parents. I mean, I know, I know it, was, it was hard for me. Is that that baby belongs to God? Yeah, not to you. Not to you. You're just you're just you're like just the caretaker. The caretaker, and you're responsible, right? You're responsible to God for the for the care of, of that of His child. Child. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So you have to answer to Him for His child. Yeah. And um, that is a huge responsibility. And you know, and it's very. I I remember because it was. Um, St. Rita. Mm -hmm. St. Rita, who, who wished her Yeah, she wished her, her two sons dead. Rather than commit, rather a, mortal than commit a mortal sin. sin against God. And I was just like, and I How knew when do? I read that, because I, I was a long time ago, and you guys were young. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what? And I was like, wished your, I could never, I could, I could never do that. I mm -hmm. knew I could never do that, mm -hmm. right? And I was like, I was like, wow, you have to do that, or you're not ever able to be a saint. Yeah. Like you have to put God above the child. child. Yeah. Well, and above what you will care and, and how what, you care and how and, you and feel. And above what you love. Yeah. It's all, well, it's actually too like in the year Grace talks about um, Abraham and um, the sacrifice of Isaac. Of yeah. Isaac, you know, and how he had to put he had to put God above his son. Yeah. You know, it's that was actually yesterday's reading in the year of grace okay you know so i mean we have to think about that and i and i mean i don't want to you know because i knew that i didn't think that way right so back in the day so i was like man you got a lot of work to do because you're not a saint right a saint would think that way and you you can't you can't get over the the love of your own oh, children child. yeah you know you, you yeah yeah you don't have that kind of love and I knew, and I knew I didn't. So mm -hmm. I just kept, you know, when you when you realize you don't have that kind of love, you just kind of put things on the back burner and say, well, uh, one day hopefully I get it. <laughs> yeah. You know, because and you just keep working at it. That's that's just what I do yeah. personally. Yeah. Okay. Quote. Well, you avoid with the greatest care all external cause of injury to the infant that you bear. Watch over your soul that no violent passion may disturb it. End quote. Yeah. So. So you have to keep the passions, a violent passion. I don't know what a violent passion is. Maybe anger. Right. Maybe even lust. Lust? Yeah, you know, violent passions. Yeah. I mean, you have to, it said you have to be very, because when we're pregnant, our hormones... Oh, they're talking while you're pregnant here. Yes, while okay. you're pregnant. Yeah, I didn't right? get that. So, I mean, it's kind of, it, if, if you're going to be like... 
Okay, I get it. I was so confused there because I was just <laughs> thinking children. I'm like, what are you talking about? No, no. I get it. So no, when this the, is the maternity. This, this is maternity. So when the child is in your womb, you have to understand that you are walking around with a living soul in your womb. Yes. You know, and that you have to keep your violent passions in check. Yes. So, right? So it doesn't And bear ex- the dignity and the, you know, yeah, right. I get it now. You're okay. right, right. So, I mean, so we have a lot. So we're, you know, we're forming ourselves at the same time we're, you know, um, nurturing this child. That's well, growing. and I mean, I could be wrong about this, but, you know, they do say, like, you know, I mean, there is a living, breathing human being soul inside your body. Right. So we know that everything you consume, that human being is consuming too. That's the reason why they decided to tell pregnant women you shouldn't drink when you're, yeah, yeah. you know. So, but but not thinking about the physical well-being, but the mental well-being. What are you consuming? <laughs> what are you con? Sorry about that. I'm not going <laughs> to stop because then I'll have to restart. But it's just my dog. What are you consuming? Uh, mentally. Yes. We don't know how much of that the child and the soul inside of us is consuming as well. And the one thing that I want to put out there too is it talk I mean in a, in the new age society we talk a lot about unbalanced hormones. Right. That you you know you're pregnant your home hormones are all out of whack. Right. So you're up, you're down, you're in, you're out, you're you know you're all these things and I think we give a justification to that. Mhm. That that shouldn't is unwarranted. Right. Like, okay, well, we're all women here. Yeah. Maybe if there's some men listening, I apologize for what I'm about to say next. <laughs> we have a time of the month. Yeah. For example, you know, and we we can tend to, as women, we know that at that time, we are very hormonal. Yes. We are very sensitive. We are very, you know, it's height. Think everything's heightened. Yeah. But it's not an excuse to lose sanctity. Right, and, I gonna, and to say, well, it's my time of the month, so my hormones have run away with me. No, well, we are we are commanded by God to keep them in check, right. to keep our wits about us, and to keep our sanity. Uh huh. Sanctity is sanity, and to keep that about us, we don't get a free pass because of some hormonal change in our body. Right, and I I can actually attest to this that it can be done. Yeah, well, can't well the saints did it because so it can be done. Well, because you know I'm of a certain age, so when yeah. you're older like I am, you go through menopause, mm-hmm. and and I and I knew like people use that as a huge excuse too. Yes, like crazy out of control women. Oh, they're yeah. just you know menopausal or right. You know somebody I knew once did this little hut and called it something goofy. I can't remember. You know for you know when. For her to go and be by herself. herself. Oh, okay. And, you know, I like see, it was I just see. stupidness, I thought. But I thought in my head, be even, and I had considered this even before I got to the age where this was an actual thing for me. Because I had said, everything I read tells me you can control that. You can. Like, because what I read is not the same thing everybody else reads. Right. So I was determined. To keep it under control. That... When it was my time, I would keep it under control. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be this crazy woman who's going through the change in life. Yeah. And gets an excuse for everything. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I, I mean, I, nobody would ever have said, oh, she's just, you know, blah, blah, blah. I, I don't remember. Yeah, no, they I just, can't. you wouldn't have because yeah. I was so focused on yeah. how to control my emotions that... It wasn't a thing. It just well, wasn't this a is, thing. This and I knew is, another woman too that was older, ten years older than me. I mean, she never would have said it was a thing. The, and this is the thing I think we have to remember about these things and about these. They are, in in my mind, and people can feel free to disagree with me on this, but in my mind, these are the results of original sin. Yes. You know, like because when God, we all know when God created Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden was perfect. Right. You know, yes. everything was perfect. They they were they wouldn't have had these things. Right. And the I, body was perfect. They 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 showed no embarrassment. They showed no this. So we know that. And you know, so these these trials is what they are because they're not pleasant. Right. 
They're not pleasant. No, they're not. There's you know, pleasant about them. They, they these things they cause women a lot of pain and a lot of stress and a lot of strife. But if we're sitting here and we're talking about, you know, now we're in the season of Lent and we we're offering up all these penances and and doing all these sacrificing, why would we then turn around and go, you know, I'm going to become unchecked and unbalanced because it's my it's, it's and I'm having it's some my cramps. Right. It's my or, right. It's yes. not your right. You it As, is, you know, uh, these are you the know. these are the effects of original sin and these are the things that we are paying for and we're paying for them now and here so that we can sanctify ourselves and get ourselves to heaven. Yeah. And deal with these li- <laughs> and I'm going to say and if you disagree with me on this, that's okay too, but little crosses. Yes. They're not that big. They're not that big. That like that, that what we go through every month, it really isn't that big of a cross. No, I mean maybe some women Maybe I'm I'm not Maybe some women have it bad. Right. Okay, okay. I know, but when you with, when with you're looking medical issues and stuff, but but, you know, but generally. Generally it's a thing that all women go through and well, it's as you know, um I I take my granddaughter to to uh, singing lessons on Fridays, and I use that opportunity to have a little chit chat. Mm-hmm. As she said, "Oh, Grandma had a talk." <laughs> I didn't. I thought I was being very natural and very, you know, covert, just swinging it into the conversation. But uh-uh. Apparently, I you wasn't. weren't as covert as she. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I did tell her that it's called a curse. Yeah. I said people don't use that term anymore, right? Uh, but it is a curse. That's that. It was it was the curse given to God. To women, mm-hmm. you know, and we they used to in my day as a kid, or as you know, they that term was what was given to the time of the month right. and all that stuff, right? Because people understood Christianity, and that's yeah. really what it was, yeah. right? And you know, men should work out their days in suffering and toil and all and that we labor, this. and we get this, yeah. you know. And so she, she just, I, you know, she just nodded and looked at me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> but anyway, so, I, anyways, okay, so quote: Go frequently to the temple of God to offer Him your offspring, and with fervent prayer, dedicate its soul and body and its whole being to the divine service. Let your soul be often refreshed at that heavenly banquet, which is a source of purity, both corporal and spiritual and which will impart to you the moral strength you have need of in your approaching trial. Respect your body and respect your soul. Respect the body and soul that are forming within you, and walk continually in the presence of God and of his angels, end quote. Well, yeah, so the book is telling us you have to up the the devotions. Right. To go much to God, like, um, and to offer the child in divi- divine yeah, service. Yeah, I saw uh, uh, that. Yeah, that you know, me. I mean, I, unfortunately, I didn't do that. Go for the temple and offer your offspring with fervent prayer. Yeah, you know, like, because uh, if we're taking it back to what we just what we said earlier, like this this child is God's child, not yours. Right. So offer it back to Him and and tell our Lord. Yeah. You know, I will do my best to care for this child, this child of yours. Well, it's right. in my care. Right. You know? I, yeah. I mean, I can't. I wasn't even Catholic when I yeah. met you guys, so I, I don't really have much. Um, I know I didn't do none do of that. the above. Yeah. You know, so I wished I had of. Like, if I could go back, there's certain things. If I could go back and change, that would be one of them. Yeah, I think we all have those. Yeah. No. So. Okay. Quote: When the hour of anxiety shall have happily passed, do not yield to an immoderate joy, but consider calmly the new duties incumbent on you. Hasten to have your child regenerated in the waters of baptism. So far it has received only a natural life, and the cries which it utters on coming into the world indicate too plainly that this life would be indeed a sorrowful gift, if it were not accompanied with that higher life which consists of the sanctification of the soul. End quote. Okay, so, th- so um, of course, when we're talking about your hour of anxiety, mm-hmm. and that means the birth of the child. Yeah. So when, you, yeah. when you're going into... Ha- the, yeah, I mean, that's their polite way of saying the birth of the child, child. right? So what st- struck me really funny was to do not yield immoderately to... Uh, not yield to an immoderate joy. To an immoderate joy, yeah. right? Like, and I mean, there is no doubt the joy that is given a woman. When, yeah. When she has a baby. Like, it's over the top. Yeah. 
Like, so he's saying don't? Yes, don't. Go it, over the top? Yeah, no, don't. Um, it's yeah, but consider calmly the new duties incumbent on you. Yeah, like, you know, think of, I mean, think, if you think of the Blessed Virgin, mm -hmm. think of how she gave forth a child. Right. They actually say that she didn't actually give birth the way normal women give birth yeah. because she didn't have original sin. Right. So she wouldn't have had the curse. Right. So that makes total sense. Right. Right. She just gave forth a child. That, right. You know, and just think of how she would be after our Lord was here. Yeah. Was like, it? you know, but like what she, you know, she had, oh, my baby, my baby. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like, no, you know, I get what like you're saying. it's, it's, I try very hard to, to, to tell women that your children are an extension of you mm. and therefore are very easy to become an extension of your self-love. Yeah. Right? Well, and if we're thinking about it, and we are thinking in regards to Mary, our Lord gave us Mary for a very good purpose. Yeah. To imitate her. Yeah. She is our mother. And if, you know, you could say, well, I'm not Mary. Well, okay, but we should be striving to imitate her. Yeah. I know we're not Mary, and I know we're not n even a decimal, you know, of what she is. But our Lord did give her to us as a spiritual mother, as the mother of yeah. all creation to imitate her. Yeah, so so you have to, um, I mean, the joy is there, obviously. I mean, the joy is there so much that you forget that you even suffered. Right. Like, that's how instant that is. And I mean, I, I feel God designed it that way, or nobody would want to right. have children. Right, but you have to, <laughs> you, know? you know, I mean, I guess God is asking, or the writer's saying, you know, maybe look at that baby like it's um, God, and it comes from God. And, yeah. You know, to see the beauty of God, mm -hmm. you know, and now you have a very serious duty. And and especially, especially heavily accentuates regenerating them in the waters of baptism because when the child is born it's natural life um but i like that he said here life would if and basically saying if they didn't receive baptism life would be indeed a sorrowful gift right right like if you do not if your child that's if pretty, you that's pretty sad to think about that's pretty sad to think about babies are, born are not baptized and not baptized that is a sorrowful gift and i mean we know it's been said i've heard many priests say it that you know if god stopped thinking about us we would cease to exist yes the hairs i mean your think head are think about that for a minute that when adam and eve when adam and eve um created original sin and the first sin god I'm sure easily could have said, "Well, you blew it." Yeah. Sorry. Like he didn't. He didn't have to save us. Right. Right. No. You know, he yeah. did not have to give us his only begotten Son to save us. Right. So think about that. That's what the author is saying. That you know, regenerate your child in the waters of baptism, or they're going to be. This life is going to be a sorrowful gift for them, not yeah. a good one. And I mean, and I'm sure all our re all our listeners. Have regenerated their children in the That's waters the very of baptism. First thing they do, they run out. No, I know them. we know that, but I mean, it yeah. is it is pivotal for us to think about how it really does put in our forefront of our mind how important these things are and how great God is. Yeah, to give them to us. Right. You know, because it's it's something that I do feel. You know, we just we do it because it's we're called to do it. And we know we have to do it. But when do you really stop and think about it and think about what you're doing? Right. When you have your child baptized? I'm not saying people don't, but I'm just saying for myself here. Yeah. It's important to be reminded of how important these things are. And when you are taking your child to be baptized, you know, I didn't I wasn't in a place spiritually to consider how important it was. Right. I was just doing it because I knew I had to. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah, because you had just come back. I had just come back, and I was like, well, I really, I thought my daughter was going to die, and I was like, I better get these kids baptized. Yeah. So it was a different situation for me. My daughter was five. Five. Yeah. My son was almost one. Well, he, was he was six, seven, seven months. Yeah. You know, like, so it's, for me, I look back, and I'm like, wow, you really done messed up. But, you know, that's, yeah, but God is good. You, God is good, you know. Well, that's, yeah, that's precisely what I'm saying. Okay, so, quote, 
when after this happy event it is restored to your bosom, a child of God and of his church, as well as the offspring of you and your husband, reverence in your infant, the holy character it has received, and in pressing a kiss upon its forehead, remember that you hold in your arms an associate of angels, a child resplendent with purity and innocence. The sentiment of respect which this consideration inspires will moderate your joy and restrain your caresses within its proper limits. End quote. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Restrain. That's, see, that's what jumped out with me. Again, with the moderate your, your joy. joy and the restrain your caresses within proper limits. Yeah. And I mean, I don't know how, I mean, I'm not a, I, oh, I'm a, like with the little kids, I'm a big hugger and kisser. You know, yeah, but all... you're not, I wouldn't say you're over the top though. No. No, I'm not, but I've seen it. I've seen I've seen it. I've seen it where they can't stop caressing and petting the and kid. And petting and the kissing, yeah. I've seen it and I felt like saying, Is that a monkey you got there? You're picking bugs out of their hair. <laughs> you know, like like it's it's cause it's Well, and we know like just in general, we know like we've and I know we've said it before, like with Catholics, moderation is key. Right. Moderation, moderation, moderation. We should not do anything to the extremes. And if you're going to Mass and all you're doing is caressing and kissing a baby. Yeah. 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 You know, like, and I know, you know, like, I think it's the appropriate times. Yeah. Right? You have to hold back the joy. This this joy of your motherhood is not during Mass. Right. You know, you're there to glorify and give honor there to, to God. Give glor- glory and honor to God, right? Yeah. So, and I and I've been at fault with this, like not with my own children, obviously, with but the grandchildren. Um, with the grandchildren, you yeah. know, like they're sitting on your lap and you're stroking their hair, and I've yeah. done it. I've done yeah. it, you know, and I so I know. Um, I don't think I've done it excessively. Please pray I have not. <laughs> 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 but I have, you know. And, but, you know, there is a time and a place for everything. And yes, absolutely, kids must get lots of hug. They must get, get lots, lots of, of kisses. kisses. That's not what we're saying. That's here. not what we're saying. But you have to put it in check. Like, and I have sat at a table where a person would not, and, I, and even, even kids as big as six or seven, Right. And they're stroking them and they're stroking them and, and they're, they're stroking, stroking them. them. Like they just can't get enough. Yeah. You know, and you and and it's just like it's very it's too much. And it, I mean it, well, I mean I don't know how other people felt, but I think you know the issue. You, yeah. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. This person from the past, not relevant to anything, Dimming. but it was just like can you stop? Well, and also, you know, you're sitting there and you're trying to have a conversation right and it's yeah it's you know sorry we had a lot of distraction going on here it's it's immoderate it's yeah it's that's the well it's just it's not it's just it's immoderate you yeah. know you you kiss you hug the you know you kiss the boobies, well I will, I will say you, you know dry the tears you, when you play you, when you know when you go to bed you give hugs yes. and kisses and when they're babies like i will say one of my fondest why the reason I do I love babies yeah I love babies Holly's the baby holder. I'm the baby holder like if there's a baby I want to hold it you know and it's and I don't sit I don't think I sit there and stroke and pet and da-da. I just love to hold them they're soft and warm and like and I think for me it's because you know God for whatever reason God's reasons um I only have two children you know and I'm not been blessed with any more than that so for me, one of my fondest moments um, when my daughter was a baby and even my son too, you know, when you're on your maternity leave and you're home and, you know, there's, when you got two kids, I'll say, ladies, there's not much to do. Right. Like, like if you're running after seven kids, maybe you probably don't, didn't have time for this. But um, I used to lay down, you know, and Ava would have her afternoon nap or whatever, and I would put her on my chest and I would just lay there with her on my yeah. chest. 
I love that. Well, that's a baby, though. Too. But no, I know. So that's what I'm saying. That's a baby, not a six-year-old. Babies need all the touch. They need and all love the, you know. Can and you're caressing her to sleep. So that's what I'm saying. There are moments where it's like, and her and I are just sitting there. At home by ourselves, not in mass, not in the yeah. company of anybody else. Like, I would never do that if somebody was over at my house. I, I Lay think, down and take a nap with the baby, you I know? I think to put this into perspective, it's the it's the fawning. It's the fawning over the child, the excessive fawning. Right. You know, I mean, again, you have to find the balance. Nobody is saying don't kiss your baby or don't Yeah, so I just head. wanted to make sure that women don't misconstrue this is, as we're saying it is when you constantly do that you actually are coddling the child right and in a way you're, doing you're not damage to the child right it's not just about you it's about them too and it's that you're kind of like sublim subliminally not like direct to them but in their mind i am the i most feel like important you're, you're thing puffing the them up yes i am the most important thing on the planet yeah like well we'll, we'll take our little adeline right now she yeah. is uh she just turned two yeah and um, for the first two years of her life, so now the mom's got to crack down, right? Yeah. This is why. This is why I think there are terrible twos. Yeah. Because for the first two years of your life, you've spent every moment catering to this child. Right. The child cries. You come. You come. The child needs this. You give it to them. Yeah. The child wants that. You give it to them. So, so they're very used to have being catered to, right? Right. And so they get to a certain age where they know they get catered to. Right. So I cry. You come give me what I need. Right. This is the way this scenario they, they, works. They learn that. They learn that, right? So by the time they're two, um, it has to stop. Yeah. You don't get to cry and get what you Do want. You because then yeah. you're really annoying. It's so, not a baby anymore. So now you have to. That's why the terrible. That's why they say terrible twos. Because I think that's the age that that's supposed to be happening. Right. You're supposed, you're supposed to supposed cut to, that off. You're supposed to be cutting that every whim you've ever had right. gets answered. And it's hard. It's hard for mothers because at two they are still cute. Yes. They are so you still want to be that mothering, nurturing. But there's a difference between mothering and nurturing. And coddling and spoiling yeah. a child. Yeah, because I really notice it with I really notice it with our little Adeline. Yeah, you know, because she's not. I'm not. We're not saying she. I'm not saying she's spoiled. No, but, but I said to Ronnie, cause she's at that age where you notice it. Oh, she was so cute and she's so adorable, and everybody was like, oh, you know, and she just, you know, she won this and she get, you know, like, yeah. you know, she, and that's the way little babies are, right? Yeah. And I said, well, I said, now you got to undo all that. Yeah, you got to do. <laughs> <laughs> I said, now you got to say, no, no, we don't have chocolate for breakfast. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. you don't get to do this just because you want, want to, do to do it. it. You know, and you can see it in her eyes. Like, she looks up at you like, what are you, why are you saying why no? Why are you all of a sudden saying no to Why me? are you saying no? <laughs> These are not words in my vocabulary, you know. <laughs> They're not, but they will be, and you will learn them. <laughs> Nobody wants that. So anyways, all right, quote. Um, this child that God has given you is set for the ruin of, sorry, oh, yeah, for the ruin or the salvation of many, according to the training it will receive in the love of the world or in the fear of the Lord. In either case, it will experience great contradictions. And as to the mother who today is so full of joy, a sword of grief will pierce her soul. These words of Holy Simeon to Mary may in a certain sense be addressed to all mothers. It is not maternal love itself a sword that penetrates their soul. They do not carry their offspring always in their arms, but do they ever cease to carry it in their heart? And how great is the torture which this love begets? End quote. Yeah, isn't that sobering? Okay, a couple of things here. This soul that you've created is set for the ruin of many. Or the salvation. Or the salvation of many. Yeah. Right, and um, I, I had a, I saw an interesting thing on on the news that a woman in Michigan was charged. Her son had um, had uh, did a, did a mass shooting. He killed four people mm -hmm. in a school. I don't know where it was. I don't. I didn't even see that. I was so blown away by that. The both the mother and the father were charged with. Um, I don't know what it was. Second degree murder. But they're up. They're up both up for fifteen years per murder. Yeah, and the mother got convicted. The father because has, of the son. Because of the son, 
right? See, they, so now they want they want someone to put the blame on. They it. want someone to put the blame on it. But I mean, in reality, the book is telling us here that your child is set for the ruin of many or the salvation of many. Yeah. Right. So in reality, the parents, the parents are going to actually pay. Like right. you are somewhat responsible. Now, the court in this case, the court said that the parents had bought the, the son the gun. Okay, well then. <laughs> and, like, uh, and they didn't pay attention. Didn't they didn't pay it. attention to all the warning signs. Right. That he was a psychopath. You know, or I'm not even going to say he was a psychopath. Like just, I think the world is so messed up. Yeah. That these people don't, they can't think, they don't know what's right, they don't know what's wrong. And, and really, the teenage years are so horrific right now. The, these people, these kids are so confused. Right. Because we have, we live in such darkness and there is no right and there is no, no wrong. Way. There's just some mesh. And, and I, mean, I've, I mean, I don't know anything about the story. I could just be making stuff up here. But the kid used to draw guns. On everything, right? So right. the school board looked at that as um, he had warning signs. Warning signs, because right. if you draw a gun, or if you play with guns, or if you say cowboys and Indians, or you know, if you if your kid does anything revolving around guns, They're gonna those be are warning signs now. according to to society, right? right. But I mean, I, I tried to say, what would why would the parents buy him a gun? But don't you think if maybe you're trying to help your son? So they took what they did was they bought him a gun and took him to the driving range and so that he would have a gun to, you know, if if that's what he's interested, okay, let's let's do this, but let's do it right. I'm mm -hmm. not saying the parents did that, right? But I'm saying I could see that that would happen. Okay. Yeah, you know that they're trying to ha help their son, yeah. and instead they gave him the tool to to go he is undoing to, to go kill all these. Well, they're pick, they're going to both pay for it. They're yeah. they're going to both he, he's he's gone to jail for life. Oh, the son is still yeah, alive? Yeah, he's still alive. Oh, he I just die. always assume they die because most times, you know, but anyways. And, but and the parents are going to So go. then they do have someone to blame. Yeah. I thought he was dead. Oh. No, he's gone away for life. And the parents are going to go with him. Okay. You know, so, I mean, and and God, and and people, people have said that, you know, like, why aren't the parents being held accountable for these rotten children? Right. Like, it's been said. Yeah. You know? Mm hmm Like, they raised them. And so here we are. Like, we're sitting on this, on this, um, a very precarious position. Mm -hmm. Because we're responsible for that, too. Right. And God says we're responsible. Yeah. To a certain degree. I mean, eventually, eventually people are, are responsible for themselves. But, I mean, in our judgment day, what we did with our children will be exposed. Yes. You know, our faults and our failings on how we raise those children will be will be shown. Well, and we will be held very accountable. Yes. You know. You know, what if I, what were you, if you were the mother of Hitler or something? Yeah. You know, or what were you the mother of St. John the Bosco? Yeah. You know what I mean? Or St. Yeah. Bernadette. Yeah. You know, like you can be... You know, the salvation or the ruin. The you salvation know? or the ruin of many. So it's it's very, um, it's a very humbling words to the parents is what yeah. I would say. And the other thing too, which I know from living experience, a sword will pierce your heart. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't personally feel like any parent gets away from that scot-free. Yeah. I mean, Mary didn't get away from it scot-free. So why should we expect that we will? <laughs> so why should you expect that you, that we will, right? Yeah. You, you, that you will, you know. And, and uh, I mean, when I, in my dark days, mm -hmm. when, I, when I thought everything had gone so south um, and wrong, I mean, uh, all I ever did was unite myself to our sorrowful mother. And a sword yeah. will appear. And like, she felt it, I felt it. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and. To be honest, like, that's what I do with everything. You know, if you're having anything bad happen in your life, you know, if you're having any humiliations or any crosses, I mean, Mary and Jesus are the king of humili queen of humiliations and crosses. Mm -hmm. You know, and they had to bear them all. Yeah. So, I mean, 
it gives you an opportunity to feel as thou has felt. That's a line yeah. out of a song. It's uh, it's the Stations of the Cross. Yeah, let me feel as thou hast Make felt. Make me feel as thou hast felt. Make my soul to glow and melt. Right, yeah. Yeah. You know, so. At the cross or station keeping. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Mm-hmm. We're going to do that every do that uh, every Friday. Every Friday we'll be doing the Stations of the Cross. And, um, and so it's just a good reminder. If you're not there yet, um, you know, brace yourself. Yeah. <laughs> if you are there yet, if you are there. Unite yourself. Unite to yourself to our Blessed Mother. The story. And no, you know, it's just, and it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to sacrifice and try to make things right. Well, you know what's funny is that, you know, like, not funny, but um, there's all these beautiful, there's, there's all these beautiful imageries out there of Mary. There's no shortage of beautiful imageries of Mary. Right. But my favorite, some of my favorite pictures or paintings or whatever you call them, imagery of Mary is the ones where she is either the piata where she's holding our Lord in her arms. Yeah. Or just once, I have a couple of them that I've found where she's looking down at the crown of thorns. Oh. You know, there's a couple different variations of it I found where it's just our sorrowful mother and she's looking down at the crown of thorns. And I don't know how these are, they're all, and they're always vintage photos too. They're like yeah. vintage. Um, but I don't know how these artists were able to, I mean, I guess a grace or a gift from God, but just to convey, um, her pure, utter sorrow Yeah. in these imageries, you know, like, and I don't get me wrong. I love the beautiful imagery of Mary, but to, when you really want to unite yourself with our lady, and I'm not saying our struggles are even where anywhere on the page of hers. But I'm just saying, if you want to unite yourself for Mary, just spend like five, ten minutes looking at these these pictures of Mary and you can see her sorrow and then you put yourself and you feel um, all the sorrow that she had seen, watching her son. Yes. And not just her son, our her Lord. Her son, our Lord. Like he was our Lord to her too, you know. Uh-huh. Go through that and the tempting and the mockery and the, you know. Mm-hmm. You, you unite yourself to that? And we tend to put our children um, on little pedestals of demigods. Yeah. Like, they're so wonderful. And, they're so, and I'm, not, I'm not saying they're not. They yeah. are. You know, I think, I think, I look at my grandchildren, they're just adorable. Yeah. You know, they're just absolutely wonderful. But um, we put them on this pedestal, and we don't think that they grow up. Right. Like, that, and you know, and... Trust me, God tells you, you know, unless you become like little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Oh. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Children do not stay as children. They become adults. Yeah. And I mean, most adult adults, um, as, well, I know that you guys, like I know how, uh, like, you know, how loving and, you know, your little devotions that you had, your little letters to St. Yeah. Joseph and all this stuff you used to do. And I, I don't know if I read it somewhere. I thought, like, would your child self like your adult self? Yeah. You know, especially when the kids get to be teenagers and that. And the answer to that question is generally no. Yeah. Well, and this is, I, I want to share this because this is actually very fitting. And I knew when I read it this morning, I was like, that just needs to be shared. And I, it's... uh it ties right into what we're saying, especially when you're thinking about your children, because we always, we look at our children and you know how we look at our children and we always want the best for them. Right. We always want them to grow up and do extraordinary things and be great people and be the best at what they do. And I read this, this isn't from, and I actually wrote it down. This is from the little catechism of the cure of ours. And it was his, um, writings on pride. And he says, quote, the good God, my children, does not require us extraordinary things. Or sorry, does not require of us extraordinary things. He wills that we should be gentle, humble, and modest. Then we shall always be pleasing to him. We shall be like little children, and he will grant us the grace to come to him and to enjoy the happiness of the saints. End quote. Right. So the cure of ours tells us right there, God does not want... The greatest and the best. The greatest and the best for you. He right. wants you to be humble, 
modest, and gentle. That is what is most pleasing to him. Right. So just like I'm just saying that to fit this in here. So when you're when we're thinking, I'm not gonna say you. Or I'm gonna say we. When we're thinking of our children, yeah, don't want the best for them. Yes. Don't want them to do extraordinary things and be extraordinary people. We should want them to be good. Yeah. Gentle, humble, modest. Modest. You know, and that's why and that's why I think this chapter is telling us to you know, get a grip on your joy. And yeah. Your love. Put it in check. Put because it, in it will check. be and I can see and I'm going to say because if you don't get a handle on it, if we don't get a handle on our joy, it will be it can be your ruin it when be, it comes it to your be children. Your ruin because a sword will pierce your heart. Because you know? that's coming, regardless. And I mean, and I'm and I'm speaking. The reason why that what the cure of ours said struck such a chord with me because, for myself, I have put so much emphasis in my life on being the best at what I do. Be and making sure my kids put their best foot forward. And you know, and I'm not saying though, like, like positive outlook. And the way you approach things is very important. Yeah. I'm not saying to be like, we're lower than the dirt. Let's all just be dumb. And, you know, like, that's not what I'm saying. No. I'm not what I'm, uh, your kids should be smart. They should be educated. They should be. But for myself personally, going forward after reading that, I want to try my best to instill in my children. And, you know, my daughter's 15, so I may have missed the boat. But I'm. that doesn't mean I'm not going to try. Right. I'm not going to throw my hands up and give up, but I'm just redirecting myself and saying that I really don't care if my children excel and are extraordinary in this life. Right. That's not what I want for them. Right. And also, too, you say your daughter is only 15. Uh, my children were far older when I had to... Redirect us? Yeah, when I when I knew this had all gone south very right. fast. Right, right. You know, when I had to re change to do, do yeah. whatever I could, like the, I mean, when I when I started, everybody was out of my control. Already almost leaving the nest. Well, they were most were most gone. Were gone, yeah. Well, I think only maybe Ronnie was at yeah. home. Yeah, but you know, and she got married very young, so yeah, she was barely at home too. So um, you know, um, it's never too late. It's never I mean, too it's late. Never too to late. And and you even know, if your children are adults, it's never too late. And we and we know that because God shows us that through the grace and power of confession. Yeah. That God like God gave us the sacrament of confession to show to us that we can always come back from whatever path, whatever mm -hmm. bad road we're on, the grace of confession brings us back. Right. As long as we treat it as such. You know, we don't abuse it. We don't right. You know, but I'm just saying, like, just sometimes we do fall into these things where it's like, well, I was 15, I done messed up, and well, here we are. Uh huh. You know, but that you can always. I, I that was an example. I'm not. I don't say I messed up my daughter. I wasn't meaning that. But we don't know yet. She's we don't, only 15. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, is like, you know, there are things that I wish I would have done. Yes. Like I said, I wish I would have been focused more on virtues instead of, you know, worldly success and, you know, whatever. So, but we just, each day, if we spiritually prepare ourselves and try to learn more and grow and do better, and we ask God for the grace to to do these things, you know, he will help us. So... And I like to, well, we're at an hour, but we didn't finish all your quotes, so we'll have to jump into them next week. But um, okay. I just, I wanted to end on a positive note because it is Lent. And um, oh. we need to. Uh, well, we need to put the work in now. We need to put the work in now. And we, I mean, you got to have a positive attitude about it too. Well, you got, well, and confidence in confidence God. Confidence in God is Like where you can never not have confidence in God, God. Right? If you're yeah. feeling sorrow. Confidence in God. You're feeling joy, confidence in God. You know. Well, and that's, a, and that's an important lesson to take from the saints as well. I mean, even through all their struggle, like they had more struggles, more strife, more penances. They were constantly offering everything up for God. That made them saints. But they always had that confidence in God. Right. That's what allowed them to do that. You know, whatever comes your way comes at the hands of God. 
Well, and you know, I was thinking about St. Rita because th- this morning I'm, I'm fueling my wood stove, right? And I was thinking about St. Rita and how when she had like an impure thought or something, and I read this in the book, she would stick her hand in the fire. <laughs> oh, <my goodness. laughs> so I'm like, I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm watching the flames go up and I'm like, how did she do that? Maybe she because just there is, n- well, I don't know what she did. Like the well, book just touched on briefly. Or she would go out and she would shove her hand in the freezing cold snow or something, you know? Like, And I was thinking in my mind, I was like, wow, yeah. that's some, that's some um, extreme confidence in God. Right. And also, you know? too, you'd soon get your emotions in check doing that. Right. <laughs> and I mean, I'm not, I don't, ev- like, I'm not, I wouldn't do it because I know I'm not spiritually anywhere on the same even planet yeah. as St. Rita. You know, like, you have to be spiritually, and we're not, we can't touch these saints, and, you know. And you're not supposed to do anything. Like, and you're not supposed to, but it's you're just. You're supposed to talk to your priest. You're supposed to talk to your priest before you go stick your hand in your wood stove. But, <laughs> They don't advise extreme, extreme penances. penances, but but it is it is just to think and meditate on that how someone was willing to do that for our Lord, you know. Yeah. And then you and then you do sit back and you go, who am I? Like, what am I doing? You know. Yeah. That if someone is out, someone lived and could do that, you I need to step it up. Right. You know. Well, now's your chance. And now's your chance because it's Lent and it's, Lent. Uh, it's time to step it up. Step it up, and then hopefully think keep less with it. The belly. <laughs> yeah. You know, oh, so, so well, we'll leave it there, and we will be back next, hopefully next week, with uh, continuing on with our chapter on maternity, which is good. And I, think, I found it very interesting. I think these are the did chapters we. Inter- I did. You know, I did a lot of great food for thought, and a lot of things I hadn't even realized. So that's good. You know, that's what like, I, like I mean, about we have a society that's just love, 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 love. love. And here our author is saying, saying get yeah. it in check. Get a grip on that. Yeah. So <laughs> get a grip. And how fitting. Oh, St. Valentine. Yeah. Pray for us. Saint today Valentine. is St. Valentine. <laughs> Not when you're listening to this, it won't be St. Valentine's Day. But today is Ash Wednesday, St. Valentine's Day. And we're talking about love. And there is a saint that can teach us about love. Right. You know. Love of God. Love of God. So. There, um, there was lots of things I used. I, I gave. We did a. I think we did a St. Valentine's little thing um, for Catholic Yeah, Catholic there's podcast. a video on there. I gave all that stuff to the sisters, sisters. all yeah. my little hearts. They just loved it when it said for the little kids to hang from the ceiling. I love my angel. I love yeah. God. Yeah. You know, and when I made little, to love one another. I made little bookmarks and I put them out with our newsletter. But then I also made a bunch and sent them down to the school for the kids at the school. And it's a little poem about um, on St. Valentine's Day, loving our Lord. Yeah. You know, like giving that love for our Lord. Because, I mean, they're kids. They don't have, quote, unquote, Valentines, you know? Yeah, and then I don't know about so all you... that anyway. Like, um, St. Valentine's Day is the day of love. So we should love, love one another. another. You know, and that's and that's And not good... let the se- secular world steal our saints. Exactly. So, on that note, St. Valentine, pray, pray for, for us. us. Um, And we'll end it. um, I hope you all have a very blessed week and a great Lent. And may our Lord bless you and Our Lady guide you always. And St. Teresa, pray for us.